In in general, in in social interactions, there's a tendency to split things into agonistic behaviour, which is conflictive behaviour, and affiliative behaviour, which is what brings them together. Uh, and curiously enough, we've we've done an awful lot more looking at. Um, agonistic behaviours, which are extremely well classified, all the ranges of uh, ways that horses can express conflict, and very little about affiliative behaviour. Although you see that they are cohesive, I mean the band goes around together. Uh, there's loads of stuff that goes on between them that maintains that spacing, who's with who, uh, sharing individual space, but loads of little touches. We've started to look at where they touch each other. Um, just little tiny touches. Uh, the movements they do, they very often pass their heads one over the, over the head of the other or over the neck of the other or over the back of the other. They sometimes rest their whole head and neck on the back of the other. Uh, the other thing we've noticed is that when they're standing very close together, resting close together, one will just move its head very slightly towards the other and, and you see the nostrils flow and they're just going they're just breathing each other for a second, like a sort of olfactory contact. Nobody's really looked at that. We seem to be much more interested in conflict than in... Uh, although there is so little conflict and there is so much bringing them together and we're not really looking at that, either academically or... Um, Sorry, but very often in, in television programmes, the horse is, is actually... Because it's jolly boring just looking at horses eating. <laughs> so doesn't make good television. What we want to see is fights. How do you think that this over-representation of agonistic behaviours in popular and scientific literature has um, affected the view of horses amongst horse people? They all seem to be very much more dangerous than they are. Um, it's not that they can't be dangerous, really, of course. I mean, you can have awful accidents with horses. Um, they can, when they're misunderstood, be very defensive, and, and that's a problem. But some forms of teaching are just full of safety rules, as if you're handling a tiger all the time. And of course, if you think it's dangerous, you go around it with this uh, rather aggressive attitude that makes the horse very defensive, and you actually produce problems more than eliminate them. Between horses, the whole thing is this, is this synchrony, this harmony of we're doing the same thing together. So they may provoke that with their with their friends. Hey, friend, shall we do this or shall we do that? Uh, they stop doing it with us because we don't we don't listen to them. They stop communicating because we're just telling them to shut up all the time, or we just have no ears for it. Do you think that people mistake affiliative behaviours for? agonistic behaviours when horses direct them towards people, for instance, nudging or touching. Yes, yes. There's loads of horses are frightened even to smell people because they've been bashed in the face for putting their noses towards people. Uh, uh, people think they're going to bite. Why do they think they're going to bite? No. Does he bite? No. I said, no, I do. <laughs> I'm much more dangerous than, than a horse, really. The problem about watching domestic horses is that domestic horses 
uh, are a great deal more aggressive than feral horses. The, even gr in grazing in fields, a stable group, you, your aggression rates are something like uh, 20 times higher than they are in a feral group. Why? I think we're not, we're not paying attention to this because what we've paid attention to is who's the most aggressive, who is the most dominant. Instead of saying, look, actually they're subject to a huge amount of stresses that we don't even think about. Uh, they're not brought up naturally. Uh, they don't learn about subtle social behaviour. Uh, very often we're creating uh, competitive aggression by giving them buckets of food. Uh, we ride them, so they're quite often uncomfortable from that. They're not natural groups. They haven't chosen to be in that group. We just, we change their groups. We buy them and we sell them. We put fences around them. We limit their space. There's a whole load of stuff there that actually produces quite a lot of stress. Even when you think you've got your horses in, in liberty. <laughs> uh, in liberty, two, two hectares would be big. Uh, these have got a thousand hectares. And your horses still run out when there's a hole in the fence? Oh yes, they find it small. <laughs> they'd, they'd like more. Um, I don't think we've got a handle on this idea of stress-related aggression and also learning-related aggression. They learn to attack other horses brings reward. So they start doing it even when there are no rewards in sight. I mean, a well-trained dog, you say sit, and it sits. How have you done that? You've produced it with food to start with. If you're trained that aggression produces food, wins the bucket, then you're liable to go on doing it even when the bucket isn't in sight and I think that's one of the reasons why they're higher. I, we haven't started analysing this because we've been uh, both on an academic level and on a um, general level. We've been much more interested in who's more aggressive to who. And that is a horrible model to base our relations with horses on.